Hello? Okay. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Hello. Hello. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So um, it's great seeing you guys, um, and welcome to. Um, your second thermodynamics for our flight thermodynamics too. Um, so you all are in the right lecture room, right? Is it for our flight thermodynamics too? Aero and mechanical? Yes? Good. Um, so uh, this is our first lecture and my first time lecturing in this building. So I have issues with these technologies here, uh, but hopefully we sort out for today. Um, my name is uh, Yasser Mamoudi Larimi. It's a long name. You can call, simply call me Yasser. That should be okay. Um, and I'm a senior lecturer um, in, in, the, in MACE. Um, I, I mostly teach, deal with thermodynamics. My research is on thermodynamics. My lectures, as always, on thermodynamics. Uh, but before coming to Manchester, I was working at Queen's University, Belfast. And again, I was teaching thermo and propulsion. Propulsion to aero and thermo to mechanical students. Um, this lecture at the, this course is shared between myself and my colleague, Dr. Jay Harish, who will be mostly helping you with the six tutorial sessions and with your labs. Um, although for labs, we have technical support from technicians um, and also a number of GTAs. Um, and you, you will be divided into a group of, I don't know, maybe five or 10. I think we are nearly 400 something this year, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then, um, you will be working with one GTA, helping you with the labs. May I ask you to please um, sit quickly and come earlier to the lecture? You're, I mean, it's a very large classroom. If you're going to come until to the end of the lecture, it would be disturbing for all your classmates. So please make sure that you are arriving to the lecture room at 2, OK?
Would you mind closing that door, please? Yeah, yeah, shut that door. Yeah, this one, this one. Yeah, come in and shut the door. You don't have to go out. Okay. Um, so the main objective in this unit would be that we will be deploying uh, your fundamental knowledge on thermodynamic one, thermal one, and we're trying to analyze some thermodynamic cycles. Um, what we're dealing, I think it's six or seven cycles, um, and we will try to analyze them one by one. If this is my, if she's my wife, tell her that I'm not here, okay? Please. Um, okay. Um, I will be dealing with the uh, two sessions will be dedicated to, please have a seat, guys, okay? Excuse me, have a seat, please. Yes. Could you, I'm going to repeat this again. Could you please try and make sure that you're here in the lecture room at two? Okay, because then until you sit and then, then prepare, then we start the lecture at five past two, okay? Um, now, two sessions will be dedicated on reviewing the um, thermodynamic one. Specifically, this lecture, I will be uh, going over the, uh, the slides a bit more fast. But when we come into the uh, thermo two materials, when starting looking into the cycles, so we'll have a more peace. Anyway, um, so, for this unit, uh, thermodynamics in general, so I need you to, um, maybe if you don't remember those, but it would be nice if you go back and take a look at your thermal one materials, specifically the first and second laws of thermodynamics. Um, and know a bit about the specific uh, heat capacity and know about thermodynamic diagrams, temperature, entropy, pressure, volume, PV, TS, uh, diagrams like this. Um, and also the concept of entropy, and what is entropy, we'll be using a lot of entropy, um, this parameter when we analyze the cycles. Uh, fluid mechanics, we don't do that much on fluid mechanics, but the knowledge on fluid mechanics is really would be nice to have. Um, and also heat transfer. Um, in this unit, we don't really deal with how heat will be transferred. We don't really analyze the mechanism of heat transfer. What we actually do, we are, we, what we need to know the amounts and the value or the amount of heat which has been transferred from one medium to another medium. Uh, so the amount of heat which has been transferred is needed. But it would be nice if you know how heat can potentially transfer uh, between two medium, conduction, convection, or, or uh, radiation. Um, so the aim, as I mentioned, that we will be looking into different thermodynamic cycles. We start with the steam cycle, uh, or Rankine cycle, um, and then we will be looking into gas power cycles. Um, refrigeration and heat pump will be also um, giving us a, a uh, a touch on those cycles as well. Um, so we'll be mostly using mathematical formula. Again, don't worry about mathematics. It would be mostly first and second law of thermodynamics um, and trying to um, analyze the system in terms of I mean, mostly the performance and also understanding how we can improve the performance efficiency of these cycles by controlling the system parameters such as pressure, temperature. Um, and as I mentioned, we will be mostly using uh, first and second law of thermodynamics. Um, there are textbooks. What, what I will be delivering to you in the lecture materials, um, 
those are enough for you to be prepared for the exams. However, I, I recommend you to take a look at the textbooks uh, which are available um, in, the, um, in, in, the, in the library. Uh, the examples and teaching materials come from different sources, different textbooks. So it's a mixture of those. But um, that, that book there, and Thermodynamics Engineering Approach, uh, ninth edition by uh, Eunice Sengel, something, Sengel, Sengel, whatever. Uh, I think that's a good one. This is going to be your, our main textbook. I'm assuming that you have, you were using this one for your thermal one, am I correct? Yes? Okay. So we'll be using that. Another textbook is also by Moran and, Shap uh, Moran and Shapiro, uh, Fundamental Thermodynamics. When I was undergrad many years ago, um, I was using this one. And believe me or not, I solved all problems in that thermodynamic book to prepare for the exam, thermal one, thermal two, all of them. Yeah. Um, but here, you don't have to deal with them all. All these lectures and all the materials are available on Blackboard. Um, assuming that you can see the materials on the Blackboard, right? Yes? Okay. Um, and you can also have access to the textbook through Cortex or the library webpage, huh? Okay. Um, so the topics that we will be covering, basic thermodynamics, will, I will be mostly dedicating two lectures, two sessions to that. Um, and the vapor power cycles or ranking cycles, again, two lectures. I will not be covering all power cycles context here because I think for you're a mix of aero and mechanical, so I had to make a balance between the cycles, which would be more relevant to your cohort. Uh, so mechanical, then, if you do the thermal three in your third year, you will be giving more um, cycles for vapors. Um, but gas turbines, both industrial and aerospace application, uh, we'll be looking into those. Reciprocating engines, such as internal combustion engines and, and refrigeration cycles. Um, so similar to most of the other units, 80% is on exam and 20% on labs and reports that you will be submitting. Um, exam. Um, there would be three or four questions for the final exam from these cycles that we will be looking into. Um, I cannot tell you which cycle you will be um, assessed based on because I cannot assess you for all the cycles would be selective. Yet you need to be prepared for the exam from all the lectures that we will be giving to you. Right. A timetable has been um, prepared and it's also uploaded on the uh, Blackboard. Um, I think your labs are I don't know if they are sometimes in February they start, um, but again, GTAs and Dr. AJ will be um, helping you with arranging for, and arranging for the labs, right? There's a deadline to submit your lab report, which is actually group report, um, and that says uh, <clears throat> 12th of May at, at 5 p.m. Okay, any question? Yes, please. Yes. Oh gosh, I cannot hear you to be honest. Can you speak a bit louder? Are we going to be reminded of Fourier's law and Newton's law of cooling if we haven't studied them in the first year? <laughs> I hear you okay. I heard you okay. Um, no, we will not be dealing with those in this unit, because this is thermodynamic unit, but I think for third or fourth year, you will have a unit called heat transfer, and you will be, or maybe you had in year one. Have you had any heat transfer unit year one? I don't think so. Okay. We don't really need them. If you know, would be okay, but we really don't use them. I'm going to say it for the third time, guys. Please make sure you're in the lecture. Let, let him join. 
Yes, she's taking off the headset. Could you please make sure you arrive into the lecture hall at 2? It is now quarter past 2 and you are still coming to the lecture room. It would be disturbing for the session. I think nobody's listening for me. Yeah, sorry, let, let me finish this one. Are we okay with your question? You mentioned you have two questions. What's the second one? Say it again, please. The lab report are group work? Yes, yes, they are. Yeah. Why? I mean, is it something that you have comments on? You're not happy with the. No, I'm fine with the group work. Okay. Yes, please. Oh, th th that gentleman was the second person. Go ahead. Tutorials are on Fridays and the lectures on Thursdays. But yeah, I sh we should have met. Ooh. Yeah, that's not 9th of February. Hey, Jay, I know I checked it three times and we didn't notice that. We should have checked with you before uploading this. <laughs> now, I will correct that. Thanks, thanks. Oh, would you mind emailing me about this? Because I keep forgetting this. Will you do that, please? Yeah, do it and I will update it tonight in the lecture and on Blackboard. Yes, please. Um, Guys, okay, sorry, I didn't hear you. Quiet, please. Oh, yes, yes. We will be doing basic thermo, I mean, what I mean, lecture is actually session. One thing I should mention is that, oh, that is very important, and I need you to listen to me very carefully. Um, your tutorial sessions are one hour long, um, but thermodyn analyzing thermodynamic cycles and lecturing that, it takes more than one hour to analyze a cycle from A to B, specifically when we deal with the uh, um, gas turbines or, or turbojet engines, it takes much longer than that. That's why I mean, the thermo that you will, I will be teaching you in the lectures, it includes dealing with uh, solving problems. Now, there, there is, that's why sometimes or some of the lectures we may not really finish, let's say vapor cycles in two, it might take two and a half sessions or the other ones, but uh, it should be more or less like this, hopefully. It depends on how you guys actually follow me, depend on what time you come to the lecture, if, like today if you're gonna, if you're gonna wait 10 to minutes so everybody come to the lecture, certainly I won't be able to deliver everything in one session so, and, and also a lot of factors involved but I do my best to follow this um, plan. Yeah. Is that okay? Any more questions? Nope. Okay. Now, um, let's now go. Oopsie. Um, I'll go very quickly over this one on the basics of thermodynamics, but um, you can take a look at your um, thermodynamic textbooks or um, the, the, the text here. We know that actually thermodynamics is actually the, the science, of, uh, science of energy. Um, and as you know, energy is actually the ability of making a causing change. And the ther name thermodynamic comes from a Greek word. Therm means heat and dynamics means power. Right. Um, this is actually what we do. We're dealing with the uh, conservation of energy. This is a very important and the first uh, um, rule or law that we use, um, which is actually based on the first law of thermodynamics. It's based on that. So conservation of energy says that energy doesn't actually destroy. It just goes from one uh, um, form to another form. And the first law of thermodynamics is effectively an expression of this energy conservation. Right. Um, so the second law of thermodynamics is also very interesting. Um, let me ask, put it that way. If I tell you that somebody is waiting outside and he says that I have one megawatt of energy in the back of my truck, 
would you like to take it or not? What will your answer be? Hmm? Say again. But what is actually energy per unit time? Yes. Yeah, that's right. That's what I meant by rate. Yeah, it's rate, yes, that's correct. So, uh, what would your answer would be if somebody says that I have a you know, one megawatt energy in the back of my truck, would you take it or not? Say something, yes or no. Or yes, please. No, that's it is what? <laughs> No, just, okay, from thermodynamic point of view, okay, my question is, can you make use of one megawatt of energy? Excellent. That's actually, that's a very good point. Um, that's where the second law of thermodynamics comes in. It says that energy, in addition to its quantity, it also has a quality. So one megawatt at the temperature of, let's say, 20 degrees C is of no use for us. But one megawatt at the te temperature of 500 degrees C, that's totally different because you can use that high quality energy and generate power or electricity. Um, that's why the second law says is that, I mean, it's not only the quantity, the quality is also important. Um, so that's... Uh, the phenomena also occur actually in the direction that the quality of the energy also decreases. So there are two ways that we can look into analyze thermodynamic cycle. One of them is the classical thermodynamics, so we don't really care about how the molecules are in track at the molecular level. We look into the uh, 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 pack or a uh, combination of molecules and how they behave in a system, which I will explain what do we mean by system. Um, but the statistical thermodynamics is actually dealing with the behavior of the individual uh, molecules or particles. You know that the statistical thermodynamics would be more accurate because you look into very fine particle scale, analyzing them, but it would be very costly in terms of a uh, very expensive way of analyzing the system. A uh, classical one is, could be a little less accurate but it is not that less difficult and less time consuming. Especially when you deal with the thermodynamic cycle where you have few components involved such as compressor, turbine, uh, boiler or combustion chamber, condenser. A statistical thermodynamic would be very difficult to analyze this. That's why we look into classical one. You've, you've done more or less the same in your thermodynamic one. You will be using uh, classical thermodynamics for that. And the same we do here in thermo two. So a system, we define system of thermodynamic as a region or a body, which is in our, our interest, and we're going to analyze that, that, that body's called um, system. Anything beyond that, that system we're looking into is called surrounding, right? And we also define a boundary, which is actually a, um, a, a, an, an imaginary surface that we draw around our system, which differentiate that from the boundary is called, and, uh, uh, sorry, from the surrounding is called boundary. Look at this, look, if you look at the gas in here, uh, if you're going to analyze the gas behavior in this um, cylinder piston configuration, if I draw a line here, this dashed line around this, this is the boundary, this dashed line. Uh, so this dashed line here is the boundary, and outside the surrounding, and inside is going to be my system. System could be, we have two types of system, thermodynamics. One of them is a closed system. Tell me what's closed system? Thermal one. What is closed system? That's correct. Well done. It's actually, oh yes, yeah. Is it uh, no heat transfer in and out? Le uh, no what? No heat transfer in and out through the boundary. The other way. Only heat. <laughs> Let's say only energy can transfer across the boundary. You got 50% correct. <laughs> so only energy can transfer. Uh, yes, please, yes. Uh, isolated system, yes, yes, there is, yeah. 
Well done. But, uh, yeah, but here, what we mean by closed system is actually a, is a system that energy can transfer across the boundary, but mass cannot. Um, very similar to the cylinder and piston configuration you see here, right? When you add heat to the gas inside these, the, 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 the chamber, the piston go up and down. So actually heat will be added to the system. And so since the piston moves up, thermodynamically we say that work is done. But the amount of mass inside doesn't change. That's the closed system, right? And in, in comparison, we have an open system where in Thermo 2 we will be dealing with mostly open systems. In addition to energy, mass can also transfer across the boundary of the system, such as a nozzle or a turbine or a compressor. They deal with heat, they deal with work or energy. Uh, at the same time, mass comes in and mass leaves the system. All right. um, you also define properties. Uh, it's actually a characteristic of a system that we're dealing with, such so as pressure, temperature, density. Um, we also have um, intensive properties, those where the property of the system is not the function of size or mass of the system, such as pressure, temperature, and density. Um, in comparison, we also have extensive properties where the property of the system is a function of size, such as volume. I mean, if you, I don't know if this is my mobile, um, it has a mass. If I break it to two, two, mass would be divided to two, right? But if it has a temperature of, let's say, 20 degrees C, if I make it to two, each piece is going to have a temperature of 20 degrees C. Hence, temperature is not a function of size, and that's going to be an intensive property. And so what is expense? Uh, a specific property, we'll be using this term a lot, is actually extensive property per unit mass, such as volume. Volume is actually an extensive property because it depends on the size. But if you divide the volume by mass of the system, it's called a specific volume, and that's going to be a specific property. So we'll be dealing with a specific volume, specific enthalpy, specific internal energy, specific entropy. Okay. I'm sure that you've done this in Thermo 1. Uh, density is mass per volume, and a specific volume is a reverse for entropy, is actually V over M, or volume over mass. Um, process and cycle. Um, so you know, I'm sure you remember that. We'll be using cycle mostly, but we will be analyzing processes as well. So any change from a system, if a system goes from one equilibrium state to another equilibrium state, is called process. Right? Now, if that system undergoes many processes, but eventually it comes back to where the system was, that's called a cycle. For example, here you see that we go from one to two. This is called a process. But here we go from one to two, two to three, three to four, and then comes back to one. That's going to be a cycle. Right? This is an example of Brighton cycle for gas turbine. Now, fall on to what a friend just mentioned about the definition of the systems. We will be using many of these terms. Isothermal process. Can, I, can somebody tell me what is an isothermal process? Uh, yes, please. An isothermal process is a process where the temperature remains constant. That's very good. Yes, you want to say the same thing, right? Oh, thanks. Well done to both of you, sir. He actually has spent the energy. You might going to pay him. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, what is an isobaric process then? You can go for that one, isobaric. Fantastic. So if it, in, the, in a, a process where the pressure doesn't change. And we also have an isochoric. Did I pronounce it correctly or isochoric? How do you pronounce it? Isochoric? We don't have isochoric, no? Okay. You guys uh, have enough English proficiency to come into this lecture, right? Because native English speaker like me. <laughs> So isochoric, okay, what that process is? Excellent, where the volume remains constant. You also have adiabatic, so um, adiabatic process. Fantastic, yes. Heat is not be transferred across the boundary or the, during that process is called isobaric, yeah. Now, very important assumption that we make in, in analyzing thermal cycle is that you can look into the processes in different terms to be in two ways, to be a steady state or transient. Uh, 
A steady state process, do you remember what that was? Excellent. It's a process wherein the property of the system doesn't change with time. So property are not time dependent. Um, but in reality, the property actually changes with time. So let, let me give you an example. For example, the temperature in, this, in, the, in the hole, right, if we take only one value for the temperature, let's assume there's in thermal equilibrium everywhere, um, the temperature is going to be 20 degrees C or 30 degrees C. If in one hour, or 10 minutes, whatever, if you come back and measure the temperature, if it's still 20 degrees C or 30 degrees C, that means that it's in a steady state process. If something happened outside, it's raining, snowing, or you add heat to this room, the temperature is still 20 after some time. So that means a steady state. But remember that, in reality, within the system, the temperature might change with position. For example, up there might be, I don't know, 40 degrees C. Down here, going to be 10 degrees C. So within a system, the temperature or property can change with position. But if you come back one hour later or any, any, any time after, there is the still 40 and here is the still 10, that means the city state. Although this, not, this is not the case in reality, uh, I mean that most of the realistic system, they would be transient, but there are systems which operate on the city state base. Let me give you another example. If you turn on your, your car and you're gonna drive and let's let go, go to Birma and I mean, while you're in the city, your speed might vary over time, right? You're in the transient or time dependent period. But when you go to the motorway, you, you will be going at the, the constant speed of, I don't know, 100 miles per hour. So that would be an steady state. So you reach into the steady state process. Now, the main assumption that we make here um, in thermo 2 is that all the processes that we have within different components of a cycle or a system, they operate under a steady state uh, basis. Okay? So, um, accordingly to this steady state process, uh, we'll be dealing with turbines, compressors, we assume they're steady state. Uh, this is an example here. If this is my control volume or open system, a steady state says, if 10 kilograms of mass comes into the system, 10 kilograms should leave. There should not be any accumulation of mass inside the system. The same applies to energy, right? If one unit of energy comes in, one unit should leave. That would be silly. So the process that you guys to this lecture room, that I have to actually monitor for 30 minutes, so during the 30 minutes time, the mass in the lecture room was changing, right? You started, so we're having people coming one by one, one by one. So that's actually, is it a steady state or an unsteady process? Say? Yeah, you can say. Yes, unsteady, because the number of people in the lecture room is increasing. It's even after 30 minutes. That's very transient process, right? Very transient. <laughs> so I'm hoping that from now on, at 2.30 until 4, probably we will be dealing with a steady state system. Huh? No more mass will come. Some of you might leave, but it's still going to be uh, an honesty process. But let's say during the next half an hour, which we're gonna, I'm going to give you a break time, then the system stays steady, hopefully. Um, now, Boyce's law, you know that it says that volume and pressure are, are, could be in inverse relationship uh, on the constant pressure uh, process, uh, or Charles' law says that for a constant pressure, sorry, for constant temperature is a Boyce's law, and Charles' law says that under constant pressure, the volume and temperature are inversely proportional, and then accordingly, we can define the state of equation says that P over V is constant, or PV equal to MRT, so we will be using this equation a lot while we're dealing with the uh, gas power cycles. Um, and you know that in, in aerodynamics that uh, V, PV equal to RT, if you just um, rearrange the equation, we can write it to P over rho to be RT, and rho is actually um, the density. So it's, it's an ideal gas law, but on different presentation. Um, now, heat and work, there are two very important actually um, uh, process or parameter we'll be using in thermodynamics. Um, heat is actually a form of energy transferred between two systems as a result of temperature difference. We have actually a specific heat, which is going to be the total heat divided by mass, and the unit is kilojoule per kilogram. So we'll be using this term a lot. The same applies to work. 
uh, and also a specific work, which is uh, W divided by M, and again, that's going to be kilojoule per kilogram. I know that you have done this in, in term of one. Um, you also have this agreement of the sign convention. If a heat added to a system, we take it positive, and heat being rejected, we take it as to be negative, and the other way around for work. The work being taken from a system is positive, and the work given to the system is negative. All right? For example, in turbine, turbine produces power for us. It gives work to us, so for turbine, work is positive. However, for compressor, it requires work to do the compression for us. And that, their work would be negative term, um, thermodynamically. Um, this is, again, a very interesting, the way that we can link what our conventional understanding of work is and link it to thermodynamic work. Um, if I can make a notation here, let's see. Um, yes. Are you still with me, guys? You're tired? No? Nope. Good. Um, so y you know that, but by definition, work is actually is a force times distance move. If you, if you imagine I take the gas, whatever, inside the cylinder piston as my system, and you, you, should, you would love my handwriting, so that's the best I can do, guys. I always get this comment at the end, but it's very much like my age. I mean, I cannot say that I'm more than 30. But. And this is a piston, right? If I just add a force here and move the piston for a distance of delta x or dx, the gas will exert a pressure on the piston. Huh? So the force is actually going to be pressure times area, that the pressure times the area of the cylinder. So, sorry, area of the cylinder or the area of the piston. You agree with me on FPA? And also delta x is actually the distance that would be the work done during this short distance. If I rearrange that, means I take A and write with this guy and keep the P here, it's going to be P A D X. Area times distance is volume. So it's going to be P D V. Or if you take the integral, um, work going to be pressure times change in volume. So it's very interesting. It says that thermodynamically, if the volume of your system, if it doesn't change, then the work, no work will be done. And that's why we say that um, we have expansion in turbines, or they call expander. The reason is that because gas expands, gas expansion means the volume increases. When the volume rises, you get the work from the system or power from the system. For compressor, again, the gas is compressed. So it's actually the volume decreases. Work is done there, but the, the work there is negative. But if you have a system wherein the volume doesn't change, then that would be the, no work will be done or be given. Okay? Any question? No, let's ask you an interesting one. Um, I was in a job interview years ago when I was graduated from undergrad, um, and the company asked me, what's the difference between a pump and a compressor? Let's see, let's, let's evaluate your first year knowledge. Difference between a pump and a compressor, or similarity between them? Yes, yes please. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Well, so I agree with the little friend that both of them, they actually um, increase pressure, let's say. So both also need work. But the difference between them is from their application. Can somebody say, except you, please. I know you know the answer, but someone else. 
that's a similarity. So they both um, increase the pressure, right? What, what the difference is? I mean, you cannot really use compressor to deal with liquids, right? Compressor deals with gases and pump deals with actually liquids. Yes, please. Exactly. Compressor deals with actually with compressing the gas itself and hence rising the pressure. But for gas, uh, I would say when you say move, you increase the head of, the, of, of your working fluid. That's why you have a higher pressure. Okay. Now, enthalpy is a very in, in, in important parameter we'll be using. In thermodynamics, sometimes we deal with the combination of some thermodynamic properties. And in this case, we deal with internal energy, pressure, and volume. Right, this um, internal energy, pressure, and volume. If you combine them all together, it will be enthalpy. We will be using mostly a specific enthalpy, which is actually the total enthalpy divided by mass of the system. Right. Um, and that's so far here. Any more <coughs> questions on this Thermo 1 stuff? No. Um, let's do a bit on. Let's take it more to the, what's the next one? Yeah, the first law of thermodynamics. Okay, I'm going to play a video here. If I go full screen, it doesn't play. Uh, the gentleman came in to help me, but it didn't help. But I'm going to play this video, and I would like you to tell me how, why this is happening, okay? I showed this to my son. He's also seven years old, and he loved it very much. So uh, let's see if I get the similar joy from you guys. Have you seen this before? Thermal one? So the water inside had been added and converted to the twist. gas or vapor twist. occupied the whole uh, <laughs> barrel. That's fine. Squeeze. Trying to cool Patience, it down and see what happens. I don't think ice is going to help you that amount of ice. But probably they need to cool it down. Water, cold water. Oh no, my God, the stopper is getting pulled in. Yeah, I'm working a little bit. Does that mean it didn't work? No. Throw, the, uh, throw some water on it. Yeah, yeah. Oh no, just grab the uh, ice unit with your hands. <laughs> <laughs> that is so wimpy. Well, I'm scared that it's going to blow up the Wait, wait, no. Oh, it's Do it. Yeah. It's giving some cake. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice one, huh? Okay. Any idea why this is so? No, um, I'll come back to you. you. You keep your answer. Anyone else? No? Yes, please. Exactly, pressure difference is the reason, I agree. Um, and why, well, why? Why the pressure drop? Uh, 
Excellent. So, okay, you go ahead, please. I'm going to hear, I would like to hear your answer. Hello? Yes, please. Yeah, you raise your hand, right? I'm going to also hear your answer. Your hands are okay, right? Because yes. you did it very hard. Well. Yeah, thanks. Thanks both of you. Okay, so it comes back. So we'll come back to this. It's actually more or less linked to the first law of thermodynamics, which actually says that the energy coming to the system uh, minus the energy leaving the system is equal to the change of the energy inside the system, or delta E system, um, which is the equation that I'm showing there. Uh, but the energy of a system um, could be having different forms. So we like to see that. It's given the form of internal energy of U, or the uh, kinetic energy, or the potential energy of the system. Um, internal energy of the system is actually is a macroscopic form of energy um, at the molecular level, right? So it deals with the um, internal um, kinetic energy, potential energy, or within, at the molecular level. That it all comes in the category of internal energy. Um, for a closed system, that would be just describing that is a system where which in mass doesn't leave or coming to the system except for energy and remember that the two forms of energy that in thermodynamic we believe that they can across the boundary are heat and work so these are two forms of energy that are across the boundary either for open or closed system however for closed system there only there's only energy that heat and work can go in and out there's no mass as such the first law of thermodynamic is written in that form that Q in or Q net minus W net is equal to delta E of the system. And it can be written in a different form. So if you get this, write this delta E in terms of um, internal energy, uh, in terms of, oh, this is, oh, it's pen. Yeah, okay. This could be written internal energy, kinetic energy, and potential energy. And if the system is a stationary, it doesn't move, actually. Your internal and kinetic energy are zero, and hence could be uh, delta U, right? And of course, written in this uh, differential form, and also maybe um, the, that's for the sorry for a per unit mass or a specific form, and this is in the differential form, right? Now I'm going to tell you. Um, I usually have a cup of coffee or something in me. Um, for example, this bottle here, right? Assume that it's it's a, a mass of gas or liquid inside, right? Um, Remember that the internal energy deals with the kinetic and potential energy of the molecules inside this system. That's part of this delta U. However, this system is a stationary. It doesn't move. It doesn't get any velocity as a whole, or it doesn't lift up or down. And that's why delta Ke and delta Pe for the system are zero. While molecules inside, they could have a change in kinetic energy and potential energy, but that is, will come into this form of internal energy or U. Are we clear here on the difference between these two sets? Yes. I use your bottle as an example. Now, um, so that's the force. Now we're looking to first of all open system. Remember that in open system the the first thing that we need to make sure is a mass balance. Remember that we mentioned uh, the main assumption here was that the system, the process are a steady state. Means there would be no mass or energy accumulation within the system. That's why the first, um, the mass balance or the continuity says that mass coming into the system should be equal to the mass leaving the system. Okay? So sigma m dot in should be equal to sigma m dot out. And um, thermodynamically also, uh, we would say that um, the uh, heat in minus heat uh, minus work, which are the uh, energy at the boundary, should be equal to the amount of heat, energy leaving the system, minus the amount of energy coming to the system, right? The term sigma, it actually represents uh, multiple inputs or multiple outputs from the system. However, 
most of the, I mean actually all the systems that we'll be looking into, or the circuits we'll be looking into, or each individual component such as turbine, compressor, or pumps, they have one inlet and one outlet. That's why we can drop the Zygma. And since the system is steady state, such as turbine, whatever mass comes in, the same mass will leave the system. That's why this M dot can also be taken out of the Zygma. And it would be simplified in the form of the second equation that I, I have here, right? Um, so, for a, for if this is the, the turbine that you have expansion in, right? The gas is coming at a m dot. Since it's a steady state system, the same m dot should leave the system. However, the, the flow that comes into the system, it has its own energy. It's got energy in, and it also has the energy leaving out. So it's going to be E, e dot out, sorry. Huh? And this E in is actually written in the form of here. This is the energy coming to the system. And the E out is this term here. Now, in addition to the masses in and out, they transfer energy. Energy or heat can also be transferred through the boundary of the system. At the same time, actually, a turbine produces work for us, a work, so we get W, power from the, from the system. So we, we have four sources of energy the heat, the work, energy leaving, energy coming in. So this should be in one form of in the form of conservation of energy. But as I said, we have one inlet and only one outlet. So this sigma term can be dropped. And since the mass coming in is equal to the mass rate leaving the system, so we can have only one m dot here. So if I rearrange these two, we come up with this equation here. Now, this is per unit mass. This all per unit mass. So this m dot has been coming here. This is m dot. Let me take this. Um, So if I take this m dot to here, so it's going to be q dot over m dot, w dot over m dot, it's going to be a small q, a small w, and that's the guy here. Uh, remember that for compressors and turbines, right? Um, and also for boilers, pumps, the change in the potential ener uh, kinetic energy and the change in the potential energy of the flow coming in and out, they're negligible compared to the change of enthalpy. Remember that the gas velocity coming to the turbine, it has a kinetic energy with itself, and leaving one, they are not the same, right? They're different. But this delta, the difference, compared to the difference in their enthalpy is negligible. As such, these two could be taken out, and we will be having this simple form of N, um, first law, which can be written, let me clear this out, that Q minus W is going to be H2 minus H1. So we'll be using this one um, a lot, while we looking into um, uh, compressors, turbines, pumps. Any question? I'm sure that you, you looked into and you analyzed them in term of one. So um, you want me to continue or you're going to take a break? Break? Can we come back at three in six minutes? Oh, let's start at three, guys. Okay. Listen, what was, uh, what was the stuff that was pumped with in the barrel, in the experiment? Yes. They have put something in the barrel. What was it? Oh, the barrel was some water in this, in the barrel. Yeah, so they added, they the added heat, heat yeah. and then the water being converted to vapor. Yeah. So it vaporized inside the barrel. Yeah. And they, they closed the top they closed and they cooled it. 
Yeah, so because of the pressure difference. Yeah, when you cool it, the volume is constant. Yeah. Imagine PV equal to MRT. Oh. Right? PV, yeah. MRT. M is constant. R is constant. V is constant. This is one volume. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you reduce the temperature, you reduce the pressure. Pressure inside reduced. Yeah. Outside is higher pressure. Bam. But in this case, the, I mean, after the foam, now the volume of the parallel itself is different. Oh, it's the same, sorry. Yeah. Hey? I have a question about the static flow. So in a static flow, we assume that mass flow rate in is equal to the mass flow rate out. You see the state? Yeah. Okay. In a state. Well, you said it changed with the, as you see from discreetly, change with the position, the direction where the mass is coming. No, no. In. Uh, I'm saying that at each equilibrium state, mm -hmm. temperature within the system could be different from one position to another position. Although thermodynamically, we assume that a system has temperature everywhere is the same. But a steady state is not the term used only in thermodynamics. It's also up to other sciences, such as fluid mechanics. So, so I'm saying that temperature here is 10, here is 50. Right? But if you come back in one hour, or if you do something on the room, if the still here is 10 and here is 50, this is a still a steady state system. So we can assume that the flow inside, whatever the flow is going, whatever the device is, compressor or turbine, inside there is a non-uniform flow? Because it's still changing over the position. Uh -huh. For the compressor, when the flow comes, or turbine, right? At different stages of turbine, you have a different pressure value. You have different temperature. You have different enthalpy. Right? However, this temperature at each position, volume, uh, pressure at each position doesn't change with time. It's only changed with position within the. Uh, so it's changing, well, it's changing with the position. So it's a non-uniform, right? Yes, yeah, it is non-uniform. Yeah. So how could the flow is non-uniform, but the massive mass flow rate in is equal to the mass flow rate out? Wouldn't the mass flow rate output change if the flow is non-uniform? Well, non-uniformity actually, I mean, if you're going to refer non-uniformity to the scientific or fluid mechanics perspective, is actually, is the flow or, yeah, as you said, coming to the system, which all points of your flow has the same velocity, let's say. That is called uniform flow. Remember that mass flow rate is actually is a mass per unit time, right? Is a kilograms per second. Mm -hmm. So the mass as a whole, whatever mass comes into the system, if the same amount of mass leaves that system at that rate, this is called. Uh, so if we see at uh, the microscopic level, right? so we're not we're dealing with at the macro level, for example, we're just saying that mass flow rate in is equal to mass flow out. But if you see it microscopically, there might be some changes. They might not be equal to each other. Yeah, so microscopic again you need to define where in the system you're going to measure the mass. But this, again, remember that we def our system is what the boundary that we define around that. So it could be related to the probability of the any particles or maybe... We're not going, we're not going to deal with the... Uh, no, we don't deal with yeah. the microscopic level. Yeah. Right. That's awesome. Thank you. How can we assume that you know, the kinetic energy and the potential energy will be negligible? Is that a reason behind it? How can we assume that? Yeah, yeah I mean, why, why are we assuming that? The reason Look, behind it? Well, if you, if you think about the turbine, maybe like this, right? Yeah. As a whole, if I take this point of the flow, respect to a data, yeah. this one, this, they have a different height, or the velocity. Velocity here in, at the inlet, might be 100 meters per second. Right. At the exit, might be 50 meters per second, right? 100 a square minus 50 a square divided by 2 gives you a value. Yeah. Right. But that value, compared to the change of enthalpy, is very small. It's negligible. For example, if this delta V squared is 1, yeah. delta H is 10. So we neglect that. So. But remember that. For diffusers or for nozzles, we can't make this assumption because their main job is changing the velocity 
diffuses actually a device which reduces the velocity and nozzle increases. There, the change in the kinetic energy is bigger than the change in onsets. So we neglect that, but we keep the change in output. Sorry, the change in kinetic energy. Thank you so much. Salam, Okay, um, shall we start, please? Okay. Well, um, another term that I would like you to introduce you is actually a specific heat. And that specific heat is actually a, it has a definition. And the definition is actually comes into this formula itself. Is the, um, is the amount of energy that is needed um, to increase the temperature of a unit of mass by one degree. Um, that is going to be Q is the amount of energy, M is the mass, and delta T is the change in temperature. Right? So, and it's a term, it's an acceptable term in thermodynamics, and it's a property of, of any substance, uh, because any substance they ha would need, I mean, one unit of mass of any substance would need different amount of energy to increase their temperature by one degree. I mean, the aluminum or compared to air or to the water, they certainly would need different amount of energy to change the temperature. Um, now, uh, as such, um, then we will have two ways, actually, or two terms for a specific heat. Uh, so materials, mainly gases or liquids, they will behave differently if you add heat to them to change the temperature on the constant pressure or constant volume process. That's why we have a CP and CV. So CP is actually is the, the amount of heat you need to increase the temperature of a unit of a mass by one degree under constant pressure condition. And CV is a similar term, but under constant volume process. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Which one do you think would be higher or bigger, CP or CV? Can you just give me your understanding of that? Or it doesn't matter. It sometimes could be CP, could be bigger, or CV could be bigger. Any idea on CP and CV? You, you know what I'm talking about, right? You, you've deal with, you dealt with that in terms of one, huh? Yes or no? Anybody's here I've never heard of CP or CV before? You know? I don't know. Who, who has not heard it? Ah, oh, English. Is there anybody that doesn't know what is CP or CV? Please raise your hand and, and don't be shy. No? Okay, then tell me the def, uh, which one would, do you expect to be bigger, CP or CV? Why? Entropy is a function of? Yes, yeah, but well, th thermodynamically, you tell me why. That, this is a question. Why the energy needed to increase the one unit of mass of a substance at constant pressure is more than that energy needed for that substance at constant volume? So that's my question. So, say it again, please. Yeah, uh, 
Um, yes, yes, please. Were you just jumping off? Oh. I hope that it doesn't shoot me off. Okay. Say the first part again. Seventy percent correct. Seventy percent correct. Yes, I, I'll come back to this. Yes, go ahead, please. Excellent. That's the same thing that. This lady was saying about. So you want to say something? Somebody raise your hand here. No? Okay, yes, exactly. That's the, that's the case. Um, at constant volume, volume process, like a, such as the one here, right? You see a piston and cylinder. If you pin the piston and doesn't try to fix it, when you add heat to the gas inside this, since the volume doesn't change, no work is done, so all the energy given is used to increase the temperature, or will be used for the internal energy of the system, right? While if you allow the system to move up and down, but at constant pressure, means that you put the weight on the piston, but you allow it to move up and down, part of the energy that you give results in increase the temperature, but partly resulted to do work for us, or actually change the volume of the system. As such, you need to add more heat in the second case to get to your desired temperature. That's why at constant pressure, more heat is needed to get to a higher, higher temperature you want, because part of the energy will be used to actually move the piston. And that's why CP is always bigger than CV. Are we clear on this? No? Yes or no? Say something, please. Okay. okay. Thanks, mate. Thank you. Now, um, so that, again, this is a first law for an uh, closed system that you see here. Q minus W is um, Q minus W delta U delta KE. Um, and if you just assume that these two are negligible, then we will have Q minus W is delta U. Remember that in constant volume process, which we are, we're trying to find out CV, under constant volume process, the volume doesn't change, meaning that no work will be done. And as such, Q will be delta U. Um, and in terms of the, uh, uh, what they say, um, and the definition of Q is at the same time is MCV delta T. This comes from this equation. Q is MC times delta T, right? So if I replace this, uh, this one here, then I'll get, and if we arrange that, you certainly will get to be CV is DU over DT. Uh, this is for ideal gases. That, although it's a general form, but we'll come back to that one for ideal gases, we can simplify this. And for, if you do the same for CP, it could be a delta H, and H is enthalpy over T at constant pressure. So that's the true definition. So we can also show that CP minus CV is R. I'm sure you heard of this. This further shows that CP is always bigger than CV. So you can use this two formula, and you can easily can prove that CP minus CV is R. Do you want me to show this, or you know how to do this? Huh? Do you want me to do this, or you would like to do it at home yourself? Sure. Yeah, thanks, my Please say something. Um, hmm. Well, if my why is okay. No, no, I need to come out of full screen mode. Okay. Um, so what we do, what I would like you to do is that if I just simply for PV and this PV, I'm going to replace RT then I can write H is equal to U plus RT, right? You know that this is a definition of 
uh, enthalpy, and this is PV equal to RT, is the one that we know for ideal gas, right? For ideal gas, PV is RT. So I'm replacing for PV from this RT. Now, what I do, I'm just going to take a derivative of, of both sides. So I'm going to say that uh, dH is going to be equal to du plus dRT. And if R is constant, so, um, so coming, coming uh, out of this, so dH. So you better do, do the other formula as well, so before I go for that. Um, Pardon? So, let me just go back to this one. We also know that this, I'm going to, I'll go back to the other slide. So, if I write it the other way around, can I say that dH is equal to Cp, oh gosh, dt? And can I also use this one? Can I say du equal to Cv dt? You agree with me? Yes? So, Will you remember these two and take to the other slide? So what I'm going to do here, what? Eraser. Uh -huh. So what I'm doing is that instead of this guy, I'm writing CPDT. Instead of this fellow, I'm going to write CVDT. Uh, and R is constant, and this is going to be DT. So if I just cancel out the DTs, then I will have Cp equal to Cv plus R, or uh, Cp minus Cv equal to R. Uh, it's, it's very easy piece. I'm sure that you've seen this, this formula before. Okay? Yes? Some of you are taking naps, so please, if you want to keep the voice down, my friends are very tired. <laughs> no, I wasn't mentioning, pointing to you, man. Okay, so let's take a look at another nice uh, experiment that is the opposite of what we've seen for the barrel experiment, and my son liked this one even more. Okay, um, any idea why is this so? Sir? Yes, please. The density of the air decreased, but you have the same mass. Therefore, the volume decreased. This is how hot air balloons fly. You've got yourself a small, you've got this, the balloon, this is how the balloon raises up, and this is how, the, and this is how hot air balloons fly. And because you've got yourself a smaller density, you can easily inflate the balloon using the same mass, because as you have the same mass and a smaller density, you have an increased volume. How can we link this to these first, for example, the first law of thermodynamics? The first, the first law of thermodynamics says that you can't create and destroy energy. So therefore, the energy has to do with things that go away. You transfer the heat energy from the, from the water in the kettle, from the heat to the air. From the water in the kettle to the air in the bottle, and therefore the air in the balloon. And in the hot air balloon, you transfer the chemical energy from the burner Okay, so um, how can we link to this one here? We don't have burner here, right? So, yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. That's well done, well done. So it's, um, it says Q minus W equal to delta U, right? So um, when you add heat to a system, uh, it's positive based on all notation. So you would expect that work to be done by the system. And thermodynamically, work definition is that the volume changes. So if you have a 
increase in the volume of the gas or the system means that the work is positive and that's, that's the reason here that you add heat you expect that your system should generate work for you and work in thermodynamic means a change of the volume or here in this case expansion so the plastic bottle is empty but it's actually too stiff to actually expand but the balloon is actually easy it can, it can expand easier right okay now um, this is a, um, a very interesting and important parameter that I will be looking into. We just said that CV is du delta T, CP is dH, dH dt, and if you take the integral on both sides, we could say that delta U, which is U2 minus U1 is the integral, CV delta T. And the same way for delta H, we can write to be CP delta T. So these are, again, some general background you can look into. In, the course here or maybe on, from the textbook. Again, I mean, all the material needed are here, so you don't really need to refer to the textbook. Um, so it, it, this is very important how we're going to deal with, with this term, uh, these two guys. Because when we, when we will be analyzing the gas power cycles, um, we will be dealing a lot with the change of enthalpy in different components of the system. For example, in in turbojet engine or maybe in our or gas turbine for a stationary application, there's a compressor, there's a burner, there's a boiler, I'm sorry, there's a turbine. Um, so if we wanted to find out the work generated by the turbine, we need to deal with the change of enthalpy of the flow or the gas into the turbine and exit the turbine. As such, these H2 minus H1, we will be using them a lot. But for ideal gas, it's, uh, no, in general, for gas, it can be written to be integral CPDT. Now, how we treat this term, CPDT, it actually determines the amount of work that we need to put in, or effort to put in to analyze the system. There are different ways. From, yes, please, yeah. Oh, it's too smooth. Um, yeah. yeah, that's a good point. When I go full screen, my annotation gets weird. What the heck happened? How can I go further up? Okay, is it okay? You see guys from the back? You see this guy? Now, now the question is how are we going to deal with this integral? But th this is the, um, that's the thing, that's the bottleneck here. There are three ways that we can do. One of them is that you write this change of enthalpy uh, with respect to a, a reference temperature, which is T naught. So this integral, mathematically, it could be written T naught to T1 CPDT minus T naught to T2 CPDT. Or this term is written to be HT2 and this term is going to be HT1. Now, HT2 and HT1, they can be found in thermodynamic tables for different substances. Um, in the one that, oh, I should have mentioned to you about the thermal table. You're, a, you, you're, you're familiar with thermodynamic table, right? The steam tables, right? In the resources folder on Blackboard, um, I've uploaded a, uh, thermodynamic table which I will be using here, this is a table SI, I will be using this for lecturing, that's uh, a nice table that is easier for teaching purpose. But in the exam, you will be given a table, will be provided to you by the exam office. The format is different from this table here, but again, I scanned that table and I uploaded it onto Blackboard. So you can make yourself familiar with that table um, while you're doing the exam. Okay? Yes, please. Say it again, please. On on Blackboard, there is a folder called Resources. Can you can somebody check if you have that access to that folder on Blackboard for this unit? You have. You see the table? Oh, yeah. Oh, you see that? Okay. Now, these H's that we were just talking about, 
um, this H2 and, and H, HT2 and HT1, they are found in table A17 for air. Remember that gas power cycles, we're dealing with them, gas turbines. So the main working fluid is air. As such, air is actually the substance that we need that. So if I go to table A17, um, so you can see that for each temperature we need, this H value is written here, right? So we read these, these H's. Uh, you see the hand here, right, for different temperature. That's one way of dealing with that. Um, another approach, another, uh, yeah, another approach is that if we know how CP varies with temperature, that we can take the integral mathematically, huh? just, just an example, if we know that this could be written, I don't know, from T1 to T2 of, uh, a T plus B T two plus C T three something times D T and this A B C are constant. So we can easily do the integral and then calculate H two minus H one. You follow me on, on this? Yes? If we know. Now, for different substance, this polynomial function is actually provided in thermodynamic table. So if I go to table A2C, um, yeah, this is here. You see that for different substances, the polynomial form of the CP is written A, B, C, and D, okay? And A, B, C, D constant are also provided here, A, B, C, and D. And the temperature range where, wherein this, this formula applies is also given here. For example, for air here, um, oh, no. So for air, we see that A, B, C, and D, they can come into this formula and then we do the interval. That's the second way. The third one is that we don't do that. We just assume that CP is constant. This guy is constant. And we just take this out of integral and we simply write that, that H2 minus H1 to be Cp times T2 minus T1. I'm sure that you've seen this formula before, right? But remember that this is an assumption that we make here. Uh, that we assume that Cp doesn't change with temperature. You following me? Huh? Um, there is one example I'm trying to show you. Um, the impact of this assumption on calculating delta H. Um, so you, 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 you agree with me, if I'm going to use this polynomial form of or approach B or approach A, it would be very time consuming while you're analyzing a cycle because you need to apply this formula on different components that would be time consuming. So we, are, we will be using this one here, it's easier to do. But since this is an assumption, an example I provided here um, to show you what is the, what would be the error of calculating delta H. Yes, go ahead. The polynomial function. Uh, in table A2C here, Oh, this, this CP is written here. That's, this is the polynomial format of A, B, C, T3. Say it again. No, no, this is the CP only. But we need to do the integral. Uh, for example, if, if say that you have air at temperature of 300 Kelvin, T1, it goes to temperature of, I don't know, 1,000 Kelvin, 
tell me what's the difference between the enthalpy at 2 minus enthalpy at 1, right? What you need to do, you need to do the integral from 300 to 1000 of this polynomial function of A, which is this coefficient, and B is this, so it's going to be A plus BT plus CT plus D, uh, T3 times DT. And this will be A T plus B half T squared plus C over 3 T power 3 plus D over 4 T to the power 4 from 300 to 1000. Now you need to put 1000 in this equation once minus put 300 in this one. It's the simple integral, right? Huh? But you know that if I'm going to do this for every component of the cycle that I'm dealing with, compressor or turbine, it's going to take a lot of my time. That's why we want to explore what would be the error if I assume that CP is constant and don't bother with this integral. Um, and accordingly, we have, um, where did it go? This, this formula, is, uh, sorry, this example. Air at 300 Kelvin and 200 kilopascal is heated at constant pressure to 600 Kelvin. You wanted to find out the change in the enthalpy uh, of this process using these different approaches. Um, the solution is uploaded on Blackboard, so I'm going to bring up the solution here. Since, again, it's part of Thermo 1 thing, I don't want to really spend time now and redo the solution. However, I'm going to show you that. Um, I think that's the one, I believe. Yeah. So if you remember appro approach A, in our, in our ap approach A, A approach was that H2 minus H1 going to be H at reference temperature minus HT1. And this HT2 and HT1 are found in table A17. Remember temperature 300 to 600. So what I do, I can read the HTs at these two temperatures from this table. So I go to this table, A17 again, at 300, this is 300, and this is the H. I read this one. And for 600, is here, and I read this one. The difference between these two is going to be the delta H. And that's what has really happened here. This two and the 309. Right? Approach A, using thermodynamic table, the delta H value is 309.02 kg per kilogram Kelvin. Is the Kelvin correct for this? I think so, yeah. So that's approach A. What was the approach B? Is that I used this, that polynomial function for A, for air, uh, and CP for air. Um, and that's the polynomial, remember that, right, from table A2, with the coefficients which are provided in that table. And then do this nasty integral that I just told you about. So it's from where did it go? Um, yeah, this one here. So this polynomial function for air, the coefficient of a, b, c, and d are here. And what I'm doing now, I'm actually doing this integral from 300 to 600. When I do the integral, once you replace for T, substitute for T of 600, another time you substitute to be 300. If you do this, uh, you will end up with this value, which is kg per kilomole, because in this table, if you give the CV to be kg per kilomole Kelvin. So how can I convert kg or kilomole to be kg per kilogram? 
Uh, I'll Please just allow me to finish this few seconds. Thank you. Um, gosh, in table one, for air, we have the molar mass to be 28.97. I'm sure you're familiar with this number. So what happens is that you divide this value, which is kg per kilomole, you divide this by the molar mass, and it gives you the value in kg per kilogram. Now, 308.64 approach B, 309 approach A. Now, if you bear with me a few more minutes, if you can, please let me finish this off. Now, the third approach was that we don't do these. We just assume that CP is constant and take it out. Huh? Now, the question is that you go from 300 to 600. We know that CP at 300 is different from CP at 600. Let me show you in this table. Um, yeah, this is for ideal gas, common, oh, it's continued. Which one is air? This is air at 300 Kelvin. I'm looking for air. Okay, this is air here. And this is a CP value. At 300 is 1.005, at 600 is 1.051. Now, if we're going to assume that CP is constant and take it out of integral, simply say CP times delta T, so which one of these two CP values I need to take? So maybe not to have a fight between these two temperatures, we would say, okay, take the average temperature. Average between 300 and 600 is 450. And I take for 450, I take the CP to be 1.02. Right? The average value. Um, and this is what has happened here is that I took the CP of 1.02. And the answer is 306. Another thing is if someone like me, okay, I don't mind about, I don't care about the integral, I don't care about HT2, HT1, I don't want to take an average value. I'm going to use the easiest way. Air temperature 300 Kelvin, I know that is 1.005, the CP value. Um, CP value of 300 is 1.005. I'm going to take this value. And I do this. If I do this, it's going to be simply as this 105 times 600 minus 300. The answer would be 301. So this is the C2, is the easiest one, but it has most assumptions in it. First, you assume CP is constant, and not only is constant, you assume that CP doesn't even change with temperature, right? But the answer is 301. While in the more accurate case, there was 309, for example. If you just look at the error that you get, it's just only 2.5%. So that's my point. 2% um, two point, two point, two, uh, two error, I actually, I accept this error, but I don't bother doing integral and looking into table and stuff like that. So in analyzing the gas power cycles, which we will be dealing with them, we will be taking approach C2, unless you are told which CP value you need to use. Following me so far? The reason is that for combustion chambers specifically, the temperature rise can go around 1,000 degrees C. Sorry, 1,000 or uh, 1,000 or 1,000 couple of hundred. Um, and that region, you see that CP is a lot more bigger than the CP as 1.05. So in that case, you will be given the value of CP if the temperature is too high, just in order to overcome the too many errors we have. Are we happy, guys, with the CP thing? Okay, now if you have questions, please go ahead. Somebody wanted to ask a question? No? Yes, please. I took the wrong. Did I? 
maybe you're mistaken. Who says that I'm wrong? Oh, I was in table, right? Table is different. 298, uh, oopsie. And there is, which, oh, which table was that? Oh, 17. It is very likely that when I was solving that problem, I used another thermodynamic table. And that's why the values are different. But I, I need to explain that to you as well. Oh, gosh, very 17. <coughs> Yeah, 319. Okay. Um, I, I agree with you. Could you please correct this, this one, into your solution, uh, if you have? This should be 300.19. Three, now, uh, I, need, I need your attention here, guys, and it's very important. If you solve a thermodynamic problem, such as this one, Using another thermodynamic table, for example, such, uh, like the one that, which is uploaded on Blackboard, this H values that you read are different, right? Here, is, I took 298 from A table, but here was 398. But this one is also would be different in another table. However, the delta, which is what we need in analyzing cycle, are the same between different thermal tables. The reason is that they, these tables have been prepared based on a reference value or reference condition. Some tables might use a different reference condition, and that's why you come up with different values in the table. However, as I said again, delta wouldn't change. Delta S, delta H, delta U are going to be the same. Does it make sense? Okay. Any question? No? What do you want me to do? You want me to continue or you want to go home? If you dare say that you want to go home. Who said that? <laughs> Raise your hand. It was you? I'll give you five marks at the end, being so brave, man. Gosh, I have a bad neck pain. Okay, I have a few, couple of more slides. Um, another example, but I don't do those examples, that one. It has to do with your thermal one. Uh, that example is actually used to help you to get your hands and yourself, again, more familiar with using thermodynamic table. But since it's to do with your thermal one, I leave it to you. Yeah, please bear with me a few more minutes. I know you're tired, but please, a uh, few more minutes. Do you want to take a few minutes break? Or you want me to finish these two slides and then you go home? No, oh, thanks. Thanks, man. But I need you to be quiet, guys, if I'm, you want me to finish this up. And, and listen, right? Remember that I did not... Thank you, guys. Um, I did not include anything from term one here. These are only terminologies or terms and, 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 and uh, contents, which we will be using them in term two mostly. Now, I'm going to introduce you with two, two of these processes that we've just talked about them in one of the earlier slides. It's one of them is the constant volume process. Um, it's very much like the case that you have gas. You have a gas here in the. Oh, you don't see my pen, 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 laser point. Yeah, the gas here, there is a piston, but it's been pinned here, so the piston doesn't move up, and you add the gas to this. So you actually, your pressure changes from one to two um, for a constant volume, right? Um, now, since the volume is constant, no work will be done. So W is zero. And the system is closed. Only heat can be added, no mass. 
will actually depart or comes into the system. As such, uh, the first law is written in this form, Q minus W delta U. Remember that here we assume that this chamber is a stationary, so no change in kinetic or potential energy of the system as a whole. As such, the first law is simplified to this. And since it's constant volume, the work is also zero, um, and hence Q would be equal to delta U. Um, and in the unit mass, a small q is delta a small u, or u2 minus u1. So q is u2 minus u1. It's a very easy peasy thing. So the first law of thermodynamics for a closed system is simplified to be u2 minus u, u1. And remember that for ideal gas now, I can write delta u to be cv delta t. And if I take the point C, assume that CV is also constant, take it out of integral, delta U would be CV delta T. And as such, I have here that Q is going to be CV delta T. You can also play around with these um, ideal gas law formulas for a constant volume process. Where PV is equal to MRT. And if you write it for a state one and a state two, if you divide them together for a constant volume process, the ratio of pressure is equal to the ratio of temperature. Right? That's for idea again. Um, at the same time, for a constant pressure process, if the pressure remains constant, again, this integral, the P is constant, is taking out of the integral, it's going to be P times V2 minus V1. So work would be P times change of pressure. I put this into the first law of thermodynamics. And it's kind of, let me just write it myself. I, I don't like that way. Oops, oopsie. Look, this is the work formula in general. If the pressure is constant, it comes out here. Delta V is V2 minus V1. This comes here. Delta U is also U2 minus U1. I take this guy to be here, P times V2 minus V1. I rearrange them. I write U with PV and U1 with this PV. U2 PV, U1 PV. We define that internal energy plus PV is enthalpy. So Q would be H2 minus H1. Hmm? And for ideal gas, the delta H is actually Cp delta T. So it's going to be Cp times delta T. This is for heat, tran um, heat transfer, or let's say first law of thermodynamics uh, for a constant pressure process. For constant volume, is actually... Um, U2 minus CV times T2 minus T1. Are we happy, guys, so far? Yes? Now, this is an example. I took it from one of those textbooks. Uh, it's a very interesting example because it shows you um, how important it is that the system that you define for your problem in order to analyze it. Um, this, this boundary that you draw. I'm not going to solve this and I'll leave it to you. However, I'm going to explain to you why it is important. Um, th this system is, says that it's a container, it's a closed container with water in it and at the top is empty and you add heat to this. Uh, so what happens is that it will actually occupy part of this, um, what they say, uh, space, right? in here. So we wanted to find, analyze the system, find the tank volume, and also find out how much heat has been added to this system to take the water pressure and temperature from a value to another value. One way to analyze this is that you draw your control, control system or the boundary to be around this guy here. But when we add heat here, if my system is this, since this boundary moves because it expands, I need to calculate the work as well. 
Yeah. However, if I take my system to analyze be the whole tank, including both of these two guys, then I don't have to be worried about the boundary of my system. Okay, it is a rigid boundary. Whatever happens inside, it doesn't affect the boundary of my system. The volume doesn't change, hence work is zero. And the first law will simplify to be Q equal to delta U. While if I would take the boundary to be here, I should have dealt with the Q minus W equal to delta U. And it would make the problem, uh, solving problem more complex. Uh, by just choosing the right system, I'm actually making it uh, simpler. So this one out, and I'm looking into this one. Anyway, um, the solution for this is uploaded on Blackboard. Um, and you can try it at home and solve this. Um, I, have, I, I need a few more minutes. I'm not going to lecture, but I need your attention. Um, next week, we'll be looking into, I think, second law, briefly on second law and the efficiency and COP, and then entropy. Now, a few points, guys. As we, as we monitor today, this again very important, and my apology if I'm just repeating this again and again, please come to the class at the right time. If you come, I mean, we are, we are one and a half hours, let's say one hour and 30 we, we, we lecture, if you're going to be for 30 minutes, the class is going to be disturbed by coming people in and out, then it, it wouldn't be very efficient. So please come into the class at the right time. Um, another thing I should have mentioned to you about the thermal unit itself. I, I know that it's a, it's a challenging unit. It's a dry unit. It's hard. It was for me, but I enjoy it very much because I do research on that. Um, however, I mean, if you come to the lecture, if you understand the lecture materials, and if you do the tutorials and some extra examples or problems that we will give to you, I'm confident that you will not have any problem for, for the exam. I have many students that they achieved uh, 100 last year in the exam. Many got first. So um, just follow as your normal activity and dedication to the unit. Thanks very much, and I'll see you next week. CP, you can, it's a constant, right? Yeah. As but I said. We have two values, but we choose 300. Oh, again, two ways you can. You can either take the value at the average temperature of 300 and 600, okay. or you can take the value of 300. Oh, so it's the an value assumption. Can't I take the value of 600? Why not, see? Uh, can't I take the value of the other one? You can. Okay. You can, yeah, you can do that. Okay, so I can choose any one. Yeah, that's why we have, look, the first thing is that we will be using this approach, right? Now, for this approach, which value you take, 300 or 600, or the value between them, it's again, depending on the complexity. 300, CP at 300 is a noun parameter. Everybody knows 1.05. So I don't bother with table at all. I get 1.05. But I can choose 600. Yes, but in the exam, I will give you the CP values. I brought this up to tell you that this is an assumption that we make. But if it's going to be different CP at different temperature, I will let you know. Uh, you will be given that value in the exam. But you can take for 600. Yeah, I mean, there's no problem with that. Yeah? Uh, in the final example, the example two, right? That uh, you showed us a graph. One of them is the solid line, and then one of them is the dark line. Um, let me bring up the Was it lecture two? Was it lecture No, the lecture number is two, but the first one is introduction, so that's zero. Well, it was dark all the time, wasn't it? I should have turned the light. Do you know how to turn the lights on? Do you see anything here in terms of lights? 
Well, yeah, okay, so it's not. Yeah. Um, so where the solid line or dashed line? So that's the solid line and then that's the dashed line. Oh, I thought that you know these from thermal one. You don't know these? You don't know this vapor doom? No? Vapor doom. This is called vapor doom, yes. In thermal one unit, so you don't know? You guys, join me there, this side. Please join me this side. Yeah, yeah, come here. <laughs> so I'm showing you here. Um, Look, if you go your thermal one, right, when you have this thermodynamic diagram, I think it's one of the, mm, where is my whole unit? I mean, I, I, then if you don't remember these, then. That's usually if you have the dotted line where your system is. Uh, no, okay, so let me explain to you then here that, um, look, th uh, thermodynamic tables, uh, sorry, diagrams, what you can write PV, TS, whatever, there are a few sections involved, so we draw them like this, and this line differentiates different phases within our system because what we have here is actually everything is solid. Inside the dome, we have, uh, sorry, uh, li this is pure liquid, sorry, liquid. Here we have liquid plus vapor, and here is pure vapor. This is called saturated vapor line. This is called saturated oh, liquid okay. line. And one to two is the process for this example that goes from one at this pressure and temperature to two, which are given the condition. Oh. Yeah, because we usually do pressure and temperature, right, for cycles. You do PT, you do PV, but I mostly use um, TS. I use a lot TS diagram. Some people even use HS diagram. They are very different diagrams. Yeah, yeah. All right, all right. Okay? Yeah, I'm not too familiar with this one. <laughs> now, if you look at thermal one content, I'm sure you will see PV. PV is a very, a very uh, the very first um, uh, diagram is a PV one. It's not PT, PV is mostly used. But PT oh. is also there, yeah. If you look at thermal one content you, uh, t book, you can see the. Right. Oh, they have a lecture. You have a lecture at uh, four? Yes, okay, so we still have time. So, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. No worries. I'm actually a physics student and then I have an exchange student. All I wanted to ask if it's still okay if I like, attend the lecture because I think it's really interesting. <laughs> yes, yeah, for sure. And yeah, yeah uh, why not? It would uh, technically also be okay like, if I enroll and like, so because it's an exchange for me, like my home university, they're pretty much, they, they let me, they, they're, they're okay with me taking this course. They would be okay. Oh yeah, absolutely. But but for enrollment, I think you need to contact admin team or that I think uh, to allow you to give you access to the. But, uh, could, could I tell them that I have like your permission? Yeah, yes, yes, All absolutely. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Why not? Sure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, oh, sorry, you were going to lecture now. That's right. Uh, apologies. No, no, no problem. <laughs> I don't want to rush you, my friend. No, no. That was my first lecture here, so it was a struggling oh, yeah. with the in this in this oh, room. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, initially struggled with this uh, <laughs> technology. Yeah, sorry for that. No, 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 okay. Uh, yeah, you have questions, sir? Yeah. Let me just. Uh, <laughs> we can um, speak while we leave. Okay? Does this work? Is this working today? Uh, yes, yes, it oh. does. It does, yes. Yeah, yeah. But it's muted at the moment. Is it muted? Yeah. And there's this, yeah, if you press that on it. I wonder if we could actually get the yes, technology to work. Yeah. Would be nice. Technology is supposed to work. Hello, hello. Can you get me? Check. I'm not going to start all that, Jasmine. I'm going to end it. <laughs> See you next time. See you. Or maybe not. 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 Maybe not.